right. Hello, everybody. This is a retry of the talk. Sorry we had some technical difficulties at the seminar, but this will be a retry of my uh, discussion about the research I have done and the research that I would like to continue to do here at Benedictine College. My name is Dr. Max Saylor. I'm an incoming professor of physics and astronomy. I graduated from Kansas State University and then worked in Vienna, Germany as the head of the nonlinear optics group there at Frederick Schiller University. So my research mainly focuses on ultrafast physics and coherent control of molecular dynamics. So this is a schematic figure of that process. Basically the red light here is the laser incoming, shining on a, here an atom. That laser then controls the motion of the electron, for example. If it's a molecule, it controls the nuclear motion. And that motion can be used to eject high energy particles and also can be used to eject high energy photons and control the motion of, and dynamics. All right. The dream of this research is to be able to control molecular reactions. For example, here you can see I'm moving two molecules close to each other and here I'm transferring an electron from one molecule to another. Right. This is a beautiful movie that I've borrowed here. Right. So this is the dream, to be able to make this kind of movie experimentally of, of molecular processes and then be able to simulate it right? so we can actually control the process. Okay. So what is ultrafast physics in general? It's the study and control of the dynamics of molecules, atoms, electrons, and photonic interactions. All right. As we described with this picture, Sometimes it, it comes under the heading of AMO physics, atomic, molecular, and optical physics. Right? Sometimes if you come from a chemistry discipline, this is the same thing as femtochemistry, only approached in a little bit different way. We, sometimes it's also called just nonlinear optics or quantum optics. Right. One of the goals of ultrafast physics is to make new and novel light sources. For example, you can see here, um, a, well, it's not actual eye surgery going on, but a schematic of eye surgery and a schematic on the right of medical imaging. For example, for eye surgery, what kind of knife would you want to use is the equivalent question to asking what kind of laser would you want to use to do laser eye surgery. Do you want it to be red or blue or green, ultraviolet, infrared? Do you want it to be high intensity and come continuously or do you want short little pulses? Right. These are all questions that can be asked and answered. All right. And these novel light sources then can be implemented. For example, laser eye surgery is done with usually typically infrared short pulse laser. This is best for doing the damage that you want to do, i.e. cutting the part of the eye you want to cut without damaging the other parts. Right. This has many medical applications, industrial applications, military applications. The other goal, the goal that I'm more interested in myself, is to be able to control molecules, right? So basically I'm using light as optical tweezers in a way. So I want to treat atoms and molecules like laser blocks, right? So with my laser, for example, I can take two molecules, I can rotate the molecules, I can bring them closer together, and I can form the bonds the way I'd like to form the bonds, right? So I can make, for example, a novel chemical, right? By bringing the two constituents together. I can also treat them like Lego blocks and break them apart in the ways that I want to break them apart. All right. So to do this, right, I need to be able to understand and control how these bonds are made, right, and I need to be able to control the orientation, right, how these molecules are oriented in space, how these Lego blocks are oriented in space, how they're vibrating in space, and how these blocks click together. All right. So how does AMO physics work in general? It's a lot like wondering how a watch works when you can just see the outer face. But of course the constituents in AMO physics, right, the atoms and molecules are too small to see directly. You can't just take apart the watch and look at the gears, right? And so maybe this is H2+, but the real problem is when you get into a complicated molecule, it's a lot more like understanding how this kind of chronographer, right, chronograph rock watch works with the phase of the moon and the month and the year. There's a lot going on there. So how do we understand this when we can't really see, right, the constituents? Well, we throw the watch against the wall, 
and see where the parts land. All right. By how far apart they are, for example, you can tell, oh, there was probably a spring between these parts. Right? By how heavy they are, it's how far away they go and how fast they go. Right? So luckily, molecules are prevalent. Right? So we do this and we do it a whole lot. And by throwing over and over and over again the watch against the wall, we can start to reconstruct how the watch actually works. Right? And after we start to know a little bit more about how the watch actually works, we can create a simplified theory right, that represents how this watch works. All right. In our case, right, we're not using watches, we're using particles. We're not using walls, we're using lasers. Right? So to do this, we need a strong laser. In this case, right, it's going across the beam, this red zigzag. These are two of my colleagues in Yenna. Right? And we need particles. We need a lot of particles, right? Because we need to do this experiment millions upon millions of times to get the relevant statistics. All right? But, of course, this isn't enough. The most important things are you need good people and you need a lot of cables. Right? So, smart people to work in the lab, a good team, and then you have to be able to do these measurements. So, this takes a lot of applications such as electrical engineering, right? computer science, to be able to record this amount of data and turn it into useful information. So let's spend a moment talking about the scale of these measurements, all right, and what we need <clears throat> to be able to understand these molecular dynamics, all right. So just like controlling this watch, right, we have to work on the right scale. If I just have a half inch wrench and a hammer, I'm not going to do much good understanding this watch, right. So I need a tweezers and a baby screwdriver. So what size and what strength and what time scale do we have to act on, right? So if I wanted to understand the dynamics of cars at stop signs and intersections, this picture wouldn't do me a whole lot of good. It would give me some hints about what's going on. But this center, central picture, right, the exposure time is too long. So I need a shorter exposure time to understand exactly what's going on. So what's a typical scale of an atom? Here you can see a logarithmic scale, right, factors of 10, right, actually a factor of 100 in each tick mark, right, so a human is around 1 meter, single cell organism is around 10 to the minus 5th meters, and an atom is around 1 angstrom, that's 10 to the minus 10 meters here at the left, right. Just for reference, the sun diameter is around 10 to the 9th meters, so roughly speaking, this, comparing your size to the size of the sun is the same as comparing an atom size to your size. Right? So very small, to say the least. So that's the size scale we want to work on. What about the intensity? What size hammer do I need to break these things apart? Well, I need a hammer that's going to be able to knock an electron out of the orbital of an atom. Right? So here's the standard picture we often show of electrons whizzing around. More accurate picture to the left is of the Coulomb potential and the energy levels. Right? So if the electron is within this bowl, I need a laser field, I need an electric field strong enough to tip this bowl, bowl and allow the electrons to roll out. All right. So what kind of intensity is that? All right. So for an example, a light bulb is 10 to the 0 watt per square meter. A solar panel right, is around 10 to the 3rd watts per square meter. This means basically a 1 meter by 1 meter solar panel can run a microwave. Right? This is around a kilowatt. All right. So what do we need for the atom, right? How strong does this need to be to remove this from an atom? The answer is very strong. So, all right, this is a simple geometric question, right? You could be asked this in physics one, physics two, maybe, right? What's the intensity at the sun's surface, right? You can just draw, draw back from the intensity here on Earth to the intensity at the sun's surface. This is around 10 to the eighth watts per square minute, square meter, right? But for an atom, this is 10 to the 20th watts per square meter to actually tip this bowl far enough to allow the electron to fly out. All right? Often you'll see this in watts per centimeter squared, but this is just the same thing. This is just a different unit, right? So this is four orders of magnitude. So this is one atomic unit. It's 10 to the 16th watts per square meter. Centimeter, excuse me. So now we have the size and the strength. What's the time scale we need, right? Remember, we want to make this movie on the right. And we don't just want it to be streaky like the car headlights. So what time scale do we need to see the nuclear motion and the electronic motion? All right. 
in just for example the right hand side is a record player right it's kind of an outdated example unfortunately but this is the slow motion of a record player needle this is around a hundred microseconds right this is 10,000 frames per second and if you're looking for a new phone or a new computer you'll they'll often lift this list the speed in gigahertz this is how many operations right this is 10 to the ninth operations per second this means it, each operation happens in about a nanosecond, right? So this is how fast your computer is going, all right? But, of course, nuclear motion is much faster than this. So compared to a computer, nuclear rotation, right? This is the rotation around the axis of a, of a molecule. This is around 10 to the 12 seconds. This is a picosecond, right? So we went to, from nano to picoseconds. We also have nuclear motion. Right, this is the vibration mode shown in the top right. This is around 10 to the minus 15 seconds. This is a femtoseconds. And then finally, if we want to trace the electron motion, we need 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Right, this is around an attosecond. Okay, so these are the extreme time scales we need. Just for reference, the standard model right now says the age of the universe is around 10 to the 17 seconds old, that's 13 billion years. So again, just for reference, right, if we take one second to the age of the universe, this is the same as one attosecond to one second. So this is the reduction in time scale we need to see this motion. All right. So how are we able to accomplish this? How are we able to accomplish this incredible strength, right, and this incredibly small time? Well, it's a lot like this figure, right? Even if you have a small stream of water, you can build it up in a bucket and dump it out all at once. Right? This gains me two, this gains me both the properties that I want. One, I've accumulated the energy, right? So I get a lot more energy at a single time when I dump it out, and I've created a small pulse, right? So this is what we do with the laser field. We do this with the laser field by making a laser that's actually chromatic, right? It actually contains many different colors, unlike a laser pointer, which is typically just one color. And we make all these laser fields march in time, right? So just like this top right picture and the bottom right picture, even though they're different frequencies, we can have them all coherently superimposed. So they march all in the same time, right? Here's a picture of that kind of thing where um, it's typically not broken down like this, but this is a, a nice picture of that where you actually take a broadband laser that can look like white light and you can split out the components and then coherently combine the components back together to make a short pulse. All right. So, what do we actually want to do with these lasers? For example, my particular fo focus right, is on the simplest molecules because that's the way science works. We build from the simple to the complex. So if we have a thorough understanding of how simple molecules react in laser fields, we can use that knowledge to control more complex molecules. So here's a map we made, right, experimentally, and then we did the calculations on the bottom left to describe how the internuclear bond of H2 acts as a function of time when exposed to a laser pulse, right? Actually, my quantum mechanics class will soon be able to do this kind of calculation. So it's actually not that difficult of a calculation once you know how to do it. The opposite extreme of H2+, plus, right, H2+, plus is very symmetric, right? It's, almost, it's basically perfectly symmetric, right? The opposite of this is helium H+. This molecule is also important, right? As you've heard the other talks in astronomy, these are both very important molecules in astronomy, for example. But this molecule, helium H+, is, is one of the most asymmetric molecules there is, right? The electron wants to be around the helium 2 plus much more than it wants to be around the H, right? So by looking at these two different molecules, we get the two extremes of the spectrum, and then we can fill in the rest, right, as behaviors in between. Something like if you're a chemist, you can talk about covalent and ionic bonding, and, right, most molecules lie somewhere in between. It's the same here between symmetric and anti-symmetric and unsymmetric molecules. All right. So what opportunities are there for students here to, to do studies with me? First, I'd like to say that, of course, I am interested in what you're interested in. So if you have an experiment and would like to get started on it, 
right? Even though it's not in my area of expertise, I have now around a decade of experiment of experience as an experimental physicist, so I'd be glad to help you out, right? And refine your plan of action, right? But also, we have opportunities um, here, both experimentally and theoretically. So one here, this is a picture of the laser that's upstairs on the third floor, right? This is new. Um, it was working, right, a few years ago, but now we have it and we need to get it working again. This should be, should be possible, especially if we have a few interested students, right? This is a very interesting opportunity if you're interested in lasers. And I would say if you went um, to grad school and, and said, I built a femtosecond laser, the only question would be, when can you start and what do we need to do to get you here, All right? That's in high demand. Also, if you're more interested on the calculation side, as we said, this is a fancy picture, but it's actually surprisingly easy to do these kind of calculations, right? We also not only have quantum mechanical calculations, we have classical calculations. So you can treat quantum mechanical problems like a distribution of classical particles. So even if you just have mechanics or engineering physics, right, you can still do these calculations. And they're surprisingly accessible, these kind of calculations. So if you're interested in the theoretical side, there's a lot of work that, to be done there. And we have some interesting open projects. Also, COVID makes this more complicated, but the original plan at least was to have a summer campaign at Kansas State University, right, in 2021, where we're going to do some measurements and work at the JRM lab. I would love to have students join me in that campaign, right, beforehand. We'd need to do some prep so everything's understood, and then we'd do some measurements there and do the data analysis back here, all right. Also, COVID dependent, right, there's also um, a good possibility still at this time that There'll be a campaign in Jena, Germany, at my, um, where I formerly worked, and that will be using the ion beam line. Again, that will be over the summer, and so if you're more adventurous and want the opportunity right, to travel abroad and see international research, that would be a great opportunity for you. You can look at the websites for both of those institutes. So finally, I'd just like to say thank you. If you'd like some more detail, about what I do or you're interested in anything I've talked about today, please come by my office. You can also get an idea right from the Google Scholar page or you can look at the Research Institute at here in Kansas or in Germany. So thank you very much.